Our family's pets are a special gift to us every day. And you know, they mean so much to me. I want to share that joy with everybody who wants a pet. And I know a lot of people are like that too. Well, if you're planning to give a gift of a living, breathing creature with its own unique needs and maybe a few challenges, you better proceed carefully. As long as it's not a surprise that everybody's in on the secret, you're likely to do much better. In case we haven't met, I'm veterinarian Dr. Jeff Nickel, along with our family dog, Miss America, and I have two cats, Tony and Gaston, who are cruising around on the floor right now. But of course, oh, there's Gaston. He's back. Each of them has a little special ribbon because we're reminded that it's Christmas time and they mean a lot to us. And if you can hear me loud and clear, please click the wow button so that I know. And if you find that this post is helpful, um, please hit the heart button. That'll be especially valuable. And you may have friends or family members who are considering a pet as a gift and please tag them on this. They can watch this Facebook Live later on my Facebook page, Dr. Jeff Nickel. And so let's talk about this whole thing a little bit. I, you know, if you have a question, by the way, anything comes up, please interrupt me with anything at all about pets. And I want to know if you've had uh, this kind of thing in your home or somebody close to you where a pet's been given and maybe it worked out well or maybe something didn't go so well. Send that in, and we can comment on that and maybe give, you, give other people some, some good information. So I want to start with a story, by the way. Um, this is a, a story about a lady named Dolores, and she came to me with a pet that she got as a gift uh, last February. She was 69 years old, and she got a cat from her adult son, a little guy named PJ. And her son adopted PJ from a local shelter, um, he, the, the backstory on PJ was that he'd been brought into uh, animal welfare, the department here in Albuquerque, having been thrown out the window of a moving car and having had pretty severe injuries uh, to his face and one front leg and had to have surgery to repair that damage. And while he was recovering, he was in a foster home. Um, and of course, you know, they fostered other cats as well. and. Uh, and it was after they finished with his recovery that he was put up for adoption. And so Dolores adopted him from the foster home. And they'd had some experience with PJ in their home with their other cats. And he'd already had a reputation of being a little bit too assertive and sort of pushy with the other cats. So, you know, the first question you have is, is this a good personality match for Dolores? Well, let's let me read you the story because I have all the details right here. Um, he scratched and bit Dolores when she tried to pick him up every single time. And whenever she held him, he got immediately agitated and tried to take a swing at her. And any attempt to restrain him, and he got pretty fierce and actually caused, you know, minor injuries. She didn't need surgery, but uh, he was pretty serious in resisting any kind of handling. So what kind of pet is this? Well, I'm, you know, he hung out at home. He nice to be with. He played. But in terms of the physical affection, it just wasn't happening. And in fact, any, she kept trying other methods of getting him to learn that she was safe and reliable and trustworthy. And it wasn't going well. And she had gotten so worried. Um, and, you know, she was on blood thinners, as it turned out. And this is not the sort of person who had any business getting injuries, uh, you know, contaminated wounds, bite wounds, scratches, that kind of stuff. And so people in that situation have to think, gee, do I have any business with this pet and should I be taking it back to animal welfare? Well, it's not that that should never happen because people do end up with pets that aren't a good fit. But, you know, in almost every case, we can make these things work out. We can help everybody to set each other up for success. And so that's what we did with Dolores and PJ. Um, so one of the problems that she had with him uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, if he, he was on a piece of furniture and... She didn't want him there, maybe on a kitchen counter, and she tried to push him off. Um, she'd get nailed. Um, and he might reach over and grab the back of her hand with his teeth, not necessarily causing a wound, but he was warning her, don't be doing that. It's not, you know. So the first thing we have to figure out with every behavior case, just like whether it's an internal stomach or intestinal disorder, a liver problem, a heart problem, a lameness, you can treat symptoms all day long, and very often 
we need symptomatic treatment, but we've got to understand the cause. So there's Tony. Thank you for showing up, my boy. Um, so we've got to figure this thing out. Um, so I told uh, Dolores that in order to set PJ up for success, he never needed to be frightened again. Now, I was able to determine that it was fear causing this, uh, which is usually a pretty good bet. When we talk about any kind of an aggressive response from a dog or a cat, more often than not, if you simply assume that it's fear related, you're going to be correct. There's plenty of other causes, but by far and away, fear is the, is the big driver for aggressive responses because these pets panic. And you think, what the heck has he got to panic about? You know, he's always been treated well. PJ hadn't always been treated well. But many pets, they're raised in a family and, and they're just easily frightened. So what we did with, with PJ was um, that I told Dolores, this is how we avoid triggering the poor guy's fear. Be and, and this was so important, not only because she could get injured, but because every time we ramp up the, the uh, neural circuits and the synapses and, the, and we tap into the long-term memory of fear-based associations with, in this case, human handling and reactive aggression, well, those responses just get faster. It's sort of like an athlete or a musician uh, who practice, or any other skill, and you practice, practice, practice. Well, there's a reason that practice makes perfect, because there are physical anatomic changes in the neural circuits of the brain that get us faster and better at these skills. Well, if you want to consider reactive fear-based aggression toward Dolores as a skill, well, it sort of was, because it got repeated and it could only get better or worse Okay, so we absolutely have to get PJ to abandon these reactions. Um, and of course, Dolores not inadvertently triggering those fear reactions is an essential part of that. So I explained to her that her job was to gently pet PJ only when he jumped in her lap. And she could use a food lure to get him there, something kind of tasty, and just put it on her, on her thigh while she was sitting in a chair. And, you know, if he, wasn't, if he didn't recognize that it was there, she could toss a few other bits onto the floor, a little closer to her, a little closer to her, to the point where he said, you know, if nobody's reaching for me, I can choose to jump up into Dolores' lap, and I can get the snack. And it's really important with these pets, if there's any tendency for fear, that they be allowed to make the choice. Because when they choose, when PJ chose to come to Dolores, she knew that, he was comfortable, he was relaxed, and he wasn't on the edge of panic. Okay, so she did that, and he started coming around and showing up in her lap. And when he was in her lap, she could certainly pet him very gently on the head and the neck and only the shoulders. And that is very unlikely to trigger a fear response or aggression in a cat. And we're talking cats only, not dogs like Border Collies like Miss America. But cats, when we study their behavior uh, among themselves in a feline group, there's a lot of mutual grooming that goes on, and it is confined to the head and the neck and the shoulders. That's the only place where they groom each other. They have a need to have their skin uh, stimulated there, but other parts of the body can trigger a problem. Now, there's some cats who are okay in other respects, but frankly, I would never pat a cat any other place because why run the risk of triggering a problem? And again, besides the risk of injury to you, uh, you're causing the cat to rehearse a fear-based reaction that we don't want at all. So Dolores only gently touched PJ, and I explained to her that if he seemed like he was getting even a tiny bit tense, just stop the affection, completely stop the affection. We wanted that little cat to always be um, associating gentle, um, relaxing uh, interactions with Dolores. Nothing but the best. And if, he, if, if she even suspected there was a hint of, that he was getting tense, even with just gentle petting and touching of the, of the neck and the shoulders and the, and the head, then she'd just stop and just let him sit there and enjoy being with her. And she was very good with this thing, and she followed the plan, and gradually PJ became uh, increasingly more relaxed, more willing to jump into her lap and stay longer. Now, there are times when, you know, you don't necessarily see these things coming. And I told her that if he started to actually look aggressive and she'd already stopped petting um, and he was pretty tense, the simple thing to do is completely ignore, say nothing, just stand up and let PJ drop off her lap 
and onto the floor. And of course, he's a cat. He's not going to fall three feet onto the floor and get hurt. Um, it's important not to scold, not to reprimand, not to swat the cat, not to spray them with water uh, or, or, you know, use a handheld foghorn, some of the things that have been done historically. But if you have a cat who's frightened and then you startle him, what you're, of course, doing in the moment is ratcheting his fear way up. And if that's done a few times, then the cat starts to associate tension and fear with being with its person. And, you know, what kind of relationship is that, right? And, you know, I got to tell you that the, the thing I respect most about Dolores was that she, um, she took this challenge on. As soon as I explained it all to her, she said, okay, I'm going to keep this cat because I think I can do this. And I, I could just tell how committed she was. And I said, you know, Dolores, I, I believe you can too. And I'll, honey, you stay here because you're going to pull the microphone off my shirt if you jump onto the floor. So, um, so I, I, I encouraged her. And, and it wasn't because I like to win every case, which of course I do. But I wanted her to, uh, to know that I felt that we could do this. And I was going to stand with her and we were going to make a success of this, if, if at all possible. So, um, so she took this challenge on, even though this probably would not have been the cat she chose if she picked it herself. And that's part of the thrust of what I'm trying to get through during this Facebook Live is that don't make pets a surprise. Everybody needs to be in on it and people need to choose their own pet. I don't care whether it's a puppy or a kitten or an adult dog or a cat, people need to be able to determine, is there a connection here? I mean, I choose my own friends. Um, you know, it's worked out better that way for me. Okay. So anyway, we, we did this thing with Dolores and she was very good about this thing. And so um, now that he's starting to get comfortable with her, he needs to be able to be handled so that she could pick him up and maybe put him into the lower half of a cat carrier crate to take him to the see the veterinarian when necessary. And the cat crates where you know, there's, there are latches on the side and the front and the back and you lift the top off, those are the kind where you can set the cat in and then very slowly and gently put the top on and very quietly buckle the edges. And when the cat gets to the veterinary clinic, it needs to... Uh, have the, the top taken off the carrier and then the doctor can examine the cat inside the bottom of the carrier, uh, give it a vaccination, whatever it needs to do. So that this way nobody's reaching in and hauling a scared cat out. I, I've seen people t open the door of the carrier and try to dump the cat onto the table, you know, like it was a sack of potatoes and the cat's in there like a monkey with all its, you know, trying to avoid being taken out because it's frightened. And fear is something that should always be handled the gentlest and kindest way possible. Not just because we all feel better, but we're going to get better results. Um, there's just no point in scaring somebody who's already panicked. Um, and so there are practical reasons that we were going to take this thing to the next level. So, Tony, you're, you're sitting on my notes here. I just want to make sure I don't forget anything about this story. Um, so, anyway, what I told Dolores to do was get a particular uh, towel that she would always have next to her when she wanted... Um, PJ to come near and to uh, improve his association with safety and, um, and gentle handling whenever he was near her, I had her get some feel away. Uh, feel away comes in a, um, let me show you this. Uh, this, it comes in a diffuser, looks like this, and you plug it into a wall outlet. And um, here's the, about the size of it, it looks a lot like a like a room freshener, and it's got a little uh, liquid that you uh, plug in below it, and I'll turn this thing around so that you can see it. There we go. And there you have it, Feel Away Classic. And this I recommend in a, a plug-in diffuser, for example, near Dolores's chair where she sat with PJ often, but also if you have a new kitten and you, um, turn this thing back around, there we go. And if you get a new kitten, um, then the Feel Away plug-in pheromone diffuser has a calming effect if it's near where the cat stays at night, for example. So it not only comes in a diffuser, but you can also get it as a, uh, as a spray. So I had her spray some of the Feel Away on the, uh, on the special towel, like this, okay? And then she would have this near her lap. And you, you pre-treat the towel, and the cat associates a calm emotional state because this promotes it physiologically in the brain. These are very well-researched uh, products. They're not prescription. You can get them at pet supply stores um, on the internet if you want to. Uh, 
And, um, and so when PJ came near her, she would have this towel in her lap, okay? So it's comfortable. And when he was sitting there quietly and maybe she rubbed his head and, and scratched him just a little bit, then what I suggested that she do, and he would be in her lap. Tony, do you think you would be a good little demonstrator for me? There you go. And then I would have her just hold the towel against the side of his head just a little bit, just a few times. Remember, this is a scared cat and he can react. And we just want him to know that it feels soft and it's comfortable. And, and touch him only occasionally, maybe just several times a day, and that would be the end of it. So she did that. And then when he started to get more and more accustomed to that and was more and more relaxed with having this thing touch him, then I would have her kind of lay part of the towel on PJ while he was in her lap. And then very slowly, and this actually took a few months, she was able to actually wrap him up with that and just let him sit and relax on her lap. And she would be rubbing his head, maybe his shoulders, just a tiny bit. Um, and by the way, you know, there's a hormone release with the physical touch. It's called oxytocin, often called the love hormone, with a good reason. Because um, when you're gently holding and touching somebody who has a real strong bond with you, um, that feel-good hormone uh, really uh, strengthens the bond. They found this to be the case with humans, dogs and cats, and other species as well. So uh, there's, there's real value in doing this stuff, but go super slowly so that, in this case, PJ could learn that everything was going to be fine. So one of the most important things I left Dolores with is that every interaction between her and PJ needed to be on his terms. And you think, wait a minute, isn't Dolores the boss? I mean, who's, who's in charge around here, right? Well, it's Dolores, and she's in charge. She's the good leader because she is setting PJ up for success. She is saying to him, look, I'm here. I'm safe. I might have a little food lure sometimes, and if you choose to come to me, then there's something in it for you. You'll get a little snack. You'll get a little bit of gentle affection. You'll get this special towel that you've learned to associate with good things. We're going to wrap you up in it just a little bit once in a while. Um, and when he's ready to leave, he can leave. Another really important takeaway on this kind of thing is that scared pets, well, in fact, no pet should be pursued or chased or cornered. And people, they make that mistake. They, they, you know, they think, well, I've got to get hold of him. I've got to take him to see the doctor or I want to hold this darn cat and get him to, to cooperate and learn that I'm a good guy or a good lady. Um, and they get, they get more scared. Every interaction needs to be on the pet's terms because they are relaxed and they choose to interact when they feel good about it. And that's how we build strong relationships, is let the other person come to you, right? Or the pet in this case. So um, I, uh, I explained to her that, um, uh, you know, just do this until he's really relaxed. And then we can do something that's actually on Dolores' terms, and that is that PJ could be taught to come to her when called. Now, with dogs, when you have a dog and you're trying to teach them to come when called, you put a little leash on their collar. You know, you have a puppy, for example, and you have food, and you step back a couple of paces, and you squat down, and you use the dog's name, and you say, come. And, of course, the puppy doesn't understand what you want, so you give a little tug um, and invite the puppy in, and then uh, he gets the food. And you can be plenty enthusiastic with a puppy. Now, a cat, on the other hand, you don't put a harness on a leash and try to tug the cat in because they just like, don't get it, okay? That's not what cats do. But they will work for food, and again, they will also come if they know that they're going to get some gentle affection and they're going to feel really nice. So I had her squat down on the floor, hold a little tasty bit of food, and, when, and hold it out for, for PJ and let him come toward it. And as he did... Her job was to capture the behavior. It's a term that's used in learning theory where the pet is already doing what you want and you put the, the command on it as the cat is coming in. So she said, as she held out the treat and as he approached, she said, PJ, come. And she gave him the food. Um, and we do that a few times, literally a, a few minutes, just twice a day. They learn much faster and the memories consolidate a lot more reliably if training is only done twice daily and only for three or four minutes each time. And that's hard for a lot of people, of course, because after three or four minutes, you say, hey, look, this cat's catching on. Why would I quit now? Well, because you finally quit when the cat's like, oh, brother, do we have to do this again? And you don't want a cat or a dog's takeaway from a training session to be, oh, God, 
How boring, right? Instead, you want them fired up and ready to, uh, ready to do it again the next time. Oh, Patty, thank you for coming. Um, I appreciate you tuning in. So she did this, and pretty soon she was able to be a further distance from PJ when she told him come, and he came in and he got the food. And we did that with Tony here when he was a baby. In fact, our two sons, gee, I guess they were probably 9 or 10 years old, and it was very quick. They were at the end of the long hallway in our house, and they would call him, and he would come to one of our sons, and he'd give him a treat. And then the other one would call him, and he'd run toward that guy and get a treat. And this cat was going back and forth. And it's to a point now that I can call Tony. He's out in our big yard or anywhere in the house, and I can call him, and very often he'll come. <laughs> um, and Beth Miller, Beth Miller, wow, so nice of you to show up. Beth Miller was one of my staff back in the 1980s. She was a high school student. And uh, when I, my general practice was still fairly young and she was a wonderful worker, very good with the clients and great with the pets. And I look back on, on those years uh, with you in my practice, Beth, and I, I think happy thoughts, darn it. And who else is here? Oh, and Patty, God, <laughs> so, thank you. So anyway, here's what we've got with these cats is we had a situation where Dolores got a cat, it could have been a dog, as a gift, it was a surprise. It was very well-intentioned, and she didn't see it coming. And she had a pretty big challenge on her hands, and she got injuries on her hands. And so my, my real message here is that it should never be a surprise. You could make the surprise telling your loved one that, hey, would you like a pet for Christmas? And if the answer is, well, yes, I would, well, then what I want you to do is go to my website, drjeffnickel.com, D-R-Jeff-N-I-C-H-O-L.com. Um, and just, it's searchable. You can put in puppies and kittens and you can learn a great deal. I've also got some general rules on dog and cat raising. Um, and one of the things in there, by the way, is the one day house training method for puppies. And yes, you can do it in one day if it's a new puppy and you just get that little guy home and the, all the steps are in the, uh, in the website. Um, you devote one full day to it, but you can usually get it done that quickly. And by the way, this, this feel-away is the calming pheromone for cats. There's one for dogs called Adaptil, A-D-A-P-T-I-L. Adaptil comes in a plug-in diffuser, um, looks just like the cat one. Uh, Adaptil also makes a collar that you can put on that the puppy can go everywhere with it. And it will help to reduce... Uh, fear and instill a calm emotional state under any situation. So during the one-day house training, when you've got the puppy in this little room where he stays chewing on a food toy an hour at a time, and then you take her out on a leash to have an opportunity to, um, uh, to eliminate in the yard, and then you reward in the way that a dog gets reward innately. They're hardwired to have the reward of an opportunity to sniff and explore off territory. So the... Uh, Tony D, what are you doing? You're looking for a toy? Um, he's looking for food. Um, people, a lot of times, you know, the puppy does the right thing in the yard, and they go, great puppy, and they give him a treat and have a big party. And the puppy goes, uh, excuse me, but I'm a dog, and that's not the reinforcer for this good behavior. That good behavior in a free-living canine social group in a territory, they earn the privilege of a hike off territory to sniff and investigate that they're not allowed to do unless they earn it. And so by giving that reward, you just take the puppy off on leash down the street where other dogs have been, it can sniff and investigate, and then it goes back to its room for another hour. And I encourage people to leave a food toy. You don't feed the puppy from a bowl that day, you feed it from food toys. So it has something to do on hourly, it gives these opportunities to uh, earn the privilege of a little jaunt off territory. If you take it out to urinate or defecate and it doesn't go, no big deal. You just go back and you put it in the room again. Um, who else tuned in here? Ann Manners, nice to hear from you. <laughs> yes, and by the way, this story of, of PJ and Dolores is similar to a challenge that Ann has had with her cat, Charlotte. Um, Charlotte's had some of those issues, a little different, but, but similar. So here's another important point that I want to share about uh, new puppies and kittens. As many people are not clear on the cost. And let's talk about veterinary fees for a minute. I know something about that. Um, 
I've, I've specialized in um, veterinary behavior medicine now, having completed my residency, but I was a general practitioner for, well, a little over 40 years. And I know something about, you know, just routine uh, veterinary medical care, like vaccination series for puppies and kittens, uh, spaying and neutering, um, and, and heartworm preventative. And so let me just give you a few figures here. The vaccination series for most puppies and kittens is going to run you about $140 with doctor exams along the way. Um, sometimes that will include uh, routine deworming. Uh, a stool exam is a very important thing to rule out any other parasites that aren't, that aren't going to be eliminated by the routine warming. Um, a fecal exam is usually going to be around uh, $35. Dogs, and in some areas of the country, cats as well, should be on heartworm preventative every month. Um, and that's going to run about $120 a year. Um, so just as routine stuff, you're probably going to spend around $700, including spaying and neutering, a lab profile that goes with it, very careful, safe anesthesia, intravenous fluids. Um, you don't have to spend $700 for all that. Uh, there are ways of doing it cheaper, but you have to be careful because sometimes you don't get what you don't pay for. And so if you want to really do it right, it's going to cost a little money. And then there are puppies and kittens who have medical problems or even behavior challenges. Uh, one of our relatives has a, has a young uh, lab who had showed up with a lameness and sure enough it's got a growth uh, disorder in its elbow called elbow dysplasia and uh, that's going to be a surgery uh, situation. Well, you don't plan on this stuff, but if you, again, if this is not a surprise to anybody. If everybody, the giver and the receiver of the gift and the pet, too, is in on the secret, um, then, you know, people can talk about that stuff ahead of time and say, do I want to do this? Do I not want to do this? Do I want to skip the vaccination series and the spaying and neutering and adopt an adult pet? These are all very legitimate things to consider before Christmas morning. So, <laughs> and so if you're the giver, you can share a lot of joy by going with the, your loved one who's going to pick out their own pet and, and share that experience. And if you really want to make it a great gift, then as the giver, you can share some of the expense too. <laughs> um, and by the way, back to these costs for just a second, there are medical insurance policies that you can get for pets uh, that very often cover these routine expenses. And people who get medical insurance for their pets, the only good time to do it is when they're puppies and kittens, before they have any pre-existing conditions. Now we know with medical insurance for people nowadays, insurance companies are not allowed to say, oh, well, you had a pre-existing condition, so we won't pay the medical cost for treatment of that. Well, they don't have to, they, they can't do that anymore. Um, but with pet medical insurance, not only can they do that, they do do that. And so people sometimes come in with a pet that's pretty sick or injured, and it's going to have some serious medical costs. And they say, gee, now I'm going to call an insurance company and uh, that way I can sort of make payments on it and it'll cost me less. Uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, there are veterinary clinics that have wellness packages. I started those at my hospital back in the 80s um, and that included the full series of vaccinations, the spaying and neutering, and unlimited physical exams. Um, and it was a great way for people to say, gee, am I concerned about my pet? Why don't I just call and schedule an appointment and have the doctor examine her? And there's no exam fee. It was a wonderful thing and it worked great for my clients and many veterinary clinics have wellness packages now. And that's another thing to consider. So if you're giving a pet as a gift, and again, it's not a surprise, um, that, can be, that can be part of the gift as a wellness package. And we had uh, many of our clients do exactly that. And boy, that makes it a real present, doesn't it? You get to pick it out yourself. You're real happy with your choice. You got somebody with you who's just supporting you every step of the way and covered uh, the major expenses, now that's a gift. Um, so, uh, anything else comes up? Uh, any questions at all about this or anything else? Miss America, why don't you sit up and say hello to our friends? I know, it's bedtime, right? Um, then you can uh, send me those questions on my Facebook page. Um, or if you want to get this Facebook Live um, in your email box, and the one I do essentially every week in your email box, along with my weekly newspaper column that shows up in the Albuquerque Journal the week before, which I call it a media blog because it goes out in social media. You can get all that stuff every Tuesday morning, and all you have to do is subscribe to my website and go to Dr. Jeff Nichol, drjeffnichol.com, and you can subscribe. It's no cost, 
And when you do, I will send you at no cost also uh, my at-home pet CPR and first aid guide. And I suggest people print those out and keep it handy uh, just in case something happens. So thank you for tuning in. And um, uh, next week, I'm going to take off for uh, the Christmas holiday. But on uh, Monday the 30th, we're going to be doing another Facebook Live on a wonderful anxiety treatment that does not involve medication. It's called the Calmer Canine by Assisi uh, Animal Health. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about that on Monday the 30th. So until then, I hope everybody has a wonderful Christmas. And thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs> Bethy. Beth says I taught her a lot. I hope it was useful. Um, Beth contacted me a few years ago and we went and had coffee. Beth, if you're back in town, get a hold of me again and we'll go out and chat some more. But just a great old friend. And, and Ann says, Merry Christmas. Um, Ann sent me a gift, by the way, that I've just sent you a, a note, Ann, and, and I put it in the mail today, of this wonderful frozen uh, mahi-mahi salmon and enormous shrimp that we're going to put on the barbecue. Uh, we have a new grill, a Traeger grill, and I'm, I'm just... You know, it comes with the rub that you put on it, the whole thing. I'm just delighted. I'm a seafood lover, so thank you, Ann. But you'll get another thank you. So anyway, I really appreciate that. So I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday and uh, full of surprises uh, that don't include pet surprises.